Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. It happens to be a uh, holiday in the US for at least for our company. Um, so we have a slightly different group uh, helping me here today. Um, so everything will go great. All right, we have a whole bunch of questions that were left over from last time. So many interesting things. All right, there was a question here from Deepa. Uh, what is dark matter? Okay, so out in the universe, we see lots of stars and other things which are not dark. They're bright. They are things where they're generating light. We can tell they're there because we can see that they're stars that are producing uh, energy and light and so on. But we can try and deduce how much stuff there is in the universe by looking at the gravitational effects of the things that are out there. So for example, when we have a, a star like the sun, it has planets that are orbiting around it that are held in their orbits by the force of gravity from the sun. But the question is, are there dark objects out there in the universe or dark things out there in the universe that are producing gravity, but which we don't detect by seeing them producing light? Things perhaps like stars, or maybe it's made of something quite different, which can have a gravitational effect without being something that we can tell is there from the fact that it's producing light and so on. So people observed from a long time ago that if you look at galaxies, so our galaxy is an example of a big spiral galaxy. Spiral, it's called the spiral galaxy. It's basically a flat pancake of stars, about 100 billion stars that are in this sort of flat pancake um, that are rotating around the center. It's a little bit like the planets rotating around the sun. The planets are more or less in one plane. They're more or less in the plane of the ecliptic. They just, they form this kind of disk around the sun made of the ordinary planets. And then there are the asteroids, the minor planets and so on also there. It's this kind of flat disk. Well, similarly, our galaxy is sort of a flat disk of stars rotating around the center. We now know at the center of our galaxy, actually there's a big black hole, but that's not so relevant. It, it still will be the case that our galaxy, we can expect the galaxy of our sort of size is gonna be this big flat collection of stars all rotating around. Okay, so then you ask the question, can you explain the rotation rates of the outer stars as it's rotating around based on the amount of mass that you can see in, in, in inside the galaxy, so to speak. And the thing that was observed first, I don't know, probably 40 years ago, 50 years ago, maybe more, even more than that, is that the rotation curves of galaxies, which means the, the kind of the, the sort of the, the period of rotation um, uh, as uh, uh, of, of outer things and so on, the speed of rotation of outer things, could that all be explained on the basis of the amount of mass that we could see existed in stars in the interior of our galaxy? And the answer was no, it didn't quite work. And so that was a little mysterious, but people thought, oh, it's something to do with the way galactic dynamics worked and so on. People got more and more confused. And there was really strange examples, like there are galaxies that are colliding with each other, where it seems that there's something that's attracting pieces of these galaxies, even though you don't see it in terms of stars. So then the question is, okay, what is this dark stuff in the universe that is not, um, that doesn't show up as, as things like stars? And you know, is it in fact correct that there's so much dark stuff in the universe? It's not been completely clear. So there are several possibilities. It could be that the estimate that there's dark stuff in the universe comes about because one's using a standard theory of gravity and maybe that theory of gravity isn't quite right because one's deducing that there's this dark stuff by looking at its gravitational effect. But maybe if the theory of gravity isn't quite right, then that deduction isn't quite right. Uh, but it seems like that's not the right explanation. So the question of what dark matter actually is, well, nobody knows. So it's possible it could be something very big, like big, like, like little black holes or planet-like things or something. That seems somewhat unlikely because you would tend to see if it was big things, if one of them went in front of a star, for example, you would see the light of the star be dimmed from where we're looking at it. So the possibility then is that maybe it's, uh, a small kind of particle. Maybe it's um, some kind of particle that is uh, that doesn't interact much with ordinary matter, um, but which nevertheless has a gravitational effect that does have a mass, but it doesn't have like an electric charge 
or any other thing that makes it interact strongly with matter. And that's kind of most people's belief about what the most likely candidate for what dark matter is. And there are lots of searches that people try to do of looking for these very slight interactions between dark matter and ordinary matter. In, in our theory of physics, there's a possibility that there are particles that are much, much lighter than electrons, for example, maybe uh, a, um, a, 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 as much as a, a, a billion trillion times lighter than electrons. Um, and those that are, that are the result of, of sort of very small perturbations in the structure of space time, um, uh, much smaller than the ones that lead to things like electrons. And that's a possibility for what this dark matter could be. Now, one of the confounding uh, strange effects is that dark matter produces gravity. And so when you have lots of gravity, it tends to make things sort of uh, 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 be attracted inward. But the universe is expanding. And one of the things that's happened the last by 20 years is a lot of detailed measurements of the rate of expansion of the universe. That's a tricky thing to figure out you know, how fast is the universe expanding? Well, it depends how far away things are in the universe. And then you have to have some way of, of knowing that there's sort of a standard candle, a, a thing which is always the same brightness, however far away from you it is, and however old the light that came from it is. And so there are things people try to do in terms of supernova, explosions of stars and the brightness of those and so on. But there are a bunch of experiments now that give one some decent estimates of kind of uh, how fast the universe is expanding. And one of the things that's that's very strange is there seems to be some potential acceleration in the expansion of the universe. But dark matter, like ordinary matter, just has a gravitational effect. It just makes things, it just makes things, uh, it pulls things together. So it will tend to make the universe slow down in its expansion rather than speed up in its expansion. And so any positive mass object will basically make the universe uh, will tend to pull things together and reduce the rate of expansion. So in order to have something which accelerates the rate of expansion, the way one would do that within the context of standard theories of gravity and so on, is to have something with negative mass. And so then there came along this idea of what's called dark energy, which is essentially negative mass stuff that is supposed to be something that can accelerate the rate of expansion of the universe. Now, if one's sort of an observer of scientific theories, one can start getting a bit skeptical at this point. It's like, well, there are these things that were attracted more than you expected, and so you invented dark matter. Oh, well, there are these things that are, that are sort of anti-attracted, repelled more than you expect, so you, uh, you invent dark energy. You're kind of piling up these various hypotheses, and that seems a little unconvincing. We don't know how this will come out. In, in our theory of physics, uh, we don't yet have enough precision in our ways of predicting what happens in cosmology to be able to say anything terribly definitive about this. But I think there's the chance that we'll be able to see how this works in, in that theory. So there's a question here from uh, Motu. Um, what is the fabric of space-time? What gives rise to it? What is it made of? Okay, well, you kind of came to the right place to ask that question. So what people believed for the last hundred years or so is that, well, okay, the question, one question is what is space, right? So, so usually when people think about space, they think about it as just a place where you put stuff. It isn't anything in particular. It's just a place, a place where you put stuff. So like you're doing Euclidean geometry, you're just putting down points in the plane, let's say. The plane exists already. It's just a background. You say, I'm going to put this point at this position. I'm going to put this other point at this position. I can say what the distance between them is. I can have all these discussions and so on. But space itself isn't anything. It's just something that I can use to put things in. Okay, so one of the things that's sort of a, a big idea of our new theory of physics is that space actually isn't just a, a place where you put things, it's something that's made of something itself. So what does that, what does that mean? Well, the idea is that space, instead of, that, that all these points that you can put down in space, 
they actually, space is just made of a whole collection of points. And there are particular points that exist in space. It's not just you can pick any position. It's there are, there, the space is made from a whole collection of discrete points. And those points don't have any particular position at first. The only thing one can say about those points is how they're connected to each other. So it's kind of a giant network. Think about it like a friend network, for example. There are all these friends. You don't necessarily know where they live geographically. You just know this person is friends with these three other people. This person's friends with these three other people and so on. And that's how we think it works for points in space, that the points in space don't, that it's not like we know geographically where they're placed. We just know which points are connected to which other points. So you might be able to say, well, if we know the whole friend network, we can kind of guess the effective geography because the people who are a kind of, uh, there's this whole cluster of people who all know each other, they're probably nearby and they're far away from people who are, who you have to go through many steps of, you know, friend to friend to friend to get to that other person. And that's kind of our theory of, of the structure of space is that the structure of space is this giant kind of network in which the, the individual pieces are kind of like atoms of space. They're the, they're the kind of discrete, uh, uh, un, indivisible points that exist in, in space, but those points are each separate kinds of points. I'll give you an analogy. So you go back 150 years, people would look at a fluid like water, liquid like water, and they'd say, water's just a continuous thing. So if you imagine, you know, can you, if you were to put something somewhere in that water, you were to attach something to a piece of water, you could say, well, I can put my thing, I can put my marker absolutely anywhere I want in this water because just this continuous fluid. Turns out that won't be true because the water is actually made of discrete molecules. And to attach something to a piece of water, in the end, you're attaching it to an individual molecule. You can't, you know, there are spaces between the molecules where there's nothing there. You can't attach it to that. If you want to attach something to a piece of water, you're ultimately attaching it to a molecule. And so it is, I think, with space, that in a sense, there's nothing in space except these atoms of space. And unlike in the case of water, where we know the absolute sort of positions of different molecules relative to each other, in space, all we know is sort of the friendship of points. We just know the connectivity of these points in space. So that, that's kind of the, the, what we think the structure of space is. Now, the question is, what, what happens to space? And the idea is that at every moment, there are little groups of these sort of atoms of space that have these little patterns of connections. And whenever the pattern looks like something, whenever it has a, a particular way of A is connected to B is connected to C is connected to A, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it's a particular arrangement, then there is a transformation that can be made from that arrangement to another arrangement. So at every moment, these kind of pieces of space are getting rewritten according to these rules. Now, it's a very weird thing because in a sense, space, uh, you know, we, we imagine that as we go through time, that there is some permanence to us where, you know, our, I can pick some object up and it just, it's, it exists. But in this model of, of the universe, it is being recreated at every moment in time. The fact that there is a coherence to the existence of the object through time is similar to the way that, you know, if you have a, I don't know, a wave in water, for example, there is some notion of, of, of there is a definite wave and it propagates across the surface of the water, but the wave is propagating across the surface of the water, but the individual pieces of water, the individual molecules of water are like just going in circles in one place. It's just the collective effect of all those molecules that gives one this notion of a, a wave that kind of persists and goes across the water. And so it is similarly, I think, with the, with the existence of objects, they are continuously being recreated at every moment in time um, uh, because the structure of space is just this network. And in fact, the, um, uh, to, to make it even more slightly complicated, the, the, the fact that this network is kind of knitted together, that these different parts of space are related, is a consequence of the fact that there are these rewrites happening, that there are these pieces of space that are, that are being sort of, uh, that, that are being rewritten, uh, that, that use each other to be rewritten. That, that in other words, you can't do a rewrite until you have multiple atoms of space that can kind of cooperate to do this rewrite. And it's that process of things sort of 
uh, being rewritten and, and connected with each other through these rewrites that kind of knits the structure of space together. So in, the, in that kind of picture, time is this progressive rewriting of the network and space is kind of the extent of the network and you kind of can go from one part of a network to the fact that the network is kind of knitted together as a consequence of the fact that all these little pieces are involved in these rewrite events. So that's kind of the, the, the small scale structure of space and time. When you look at it on a large scale, it's just like what happens in water. There are a bunch of molecules bouncing around and they bounce around in very random ways. If you looked under, we don't actually have microscopes powerful enough to do this for water, but if we, if we look, uh, if we could imagine seeing all these molecules bouncing around, they're bouncing around in all these random ways and it's pretty complicated, but on a large scale, the water just seems like it's some fluid that's flowing in some way that's pretty easy to describe. And so it is, I think, with space that even though these atoms of space are doing all these very complicated things on a very small scale, when it comes to the scale on which we are used to perceiving space, space appears nice and uniform and we can just say we can put things pretty much anywhere we can pick in space at the scale we're dealing with it. The actual scale of the sort of, in a sense, the effective distance between atoms of space might be, I don't know, 10 to the minus 100 meters. In other words, that's a, you know, a trillion, 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 trillion of a So it's a very, very small distance. It's, uh, it's very tiny. For example, a, uh, a proton is um, about a thousand trillionth of a meter across. So this elementary length in space is really, really, really tiny compared to the kinds of objects that we, that we know about. So anyway, that's, a, that's sort of a picture of what, what space might be made of. Now on a large scale, space, we can think about space as being this kind of, uh, uh, people talk about the fabric of space-time. Um, that's kind of the notion that there is a, uh, a way of thinking about space-time as sort of a continuous thing. And the structure of space-time is affected in particular by the presence of massive objects in, in space. So this is sort of the, the classic fact about general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity from 1915. The, uh, the, the, okay, so the, the basic idea is, what's a straight line? Well, we're used to the idea if we have a piece of paper, it's a flat thing, we, make, uh, we put down two points, we say, what's the shortest path between these two points? Oh, it's a straight line. Okay, now we put those points on the surface of a sphere. We say, what are the, what's the shortest path between those two points? Well, it's a curved path, the great circle path on the sphere. Looked at from the outside, it's not a straight line. It's a line that's curved on the surface of the sphere. And we can, as we look at different kinds of surfaces, we can say, well, the, the shortest path is something which at least looked at from the outside, doesn't look like a straight line, although sort of within the surface, it is the straight line of the surface, the shortest path between two points. Okay, so then the idea is that the structure of space as it exists in the universe is distorted by the presence of mass. So when there's a star sitting there in space, it's essentially deforming the very structure of space. And that means that what, what counted as a straight line, what was a, an ordinary straight line, now the straight lines are actually things which looked at from the outside are curved. And they're curved in just such a way that if you were to say, oh, I should have said something else, which is that the, when there are no forces acting on something, then you expect it to just go in a straight line. And for example, you know, you, you, you shoot a laser somewhere, you'll see the laser just makes a straight line of light. And, but the question is, who's straight line, so to speak? And the whole point is that in the presence of mass, what general relativity says is that the presence of mass leads to a distortion in the structure of space that is such that the straight lines in that distorted space correspond to curved paths when looked at from the outside. And the curvature of those paths is exactly what you would expect from the idea that there's a sort of force of gravity associated with that mass. So in our models of physics, the way that works is energy and mass are associated essentially with the density of activity in the network. And it then turns out that it's a purely mathematical fact that in, our, in the structure of our systems, that the, 
the, the sort of shortest paths are when there is lots of activity in the network, it will essentially distort the effective structure of space that's produced by the effect of all of these different connections in the network in just such a way that it will distort the paths um, in, uh, uh, as, a, as a result of the presence of energy or the presence of mass, which is sort of an equivalent kind of thing. And the mathematical structure of that distortion turns out to be exactly what general relativity says it should be. And that's sort of exciting to us because it means that from something much lower level, from just talking about atoms of space and connections between atoms of space and rewritings of atoms of space and so on, that we're reproducing kind of the, the things that have been well investigated experimentally in the theory of gravity and in general relativity. So that's sort of been exciting to us. But I, I think it's interesting to kind of see, uh, you know, one can ask the question, how come there's anything that sort of permanently exists through time in the universe? All these little microscopic atoms of space, they're all getting rearranged, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is it that persists? Well, it's a little bit, we can again use an analogy of a fluid. If you've got some water and you make a vortex, a whirlpool type thing. It's just sort of going around in the water. You can easily do that. If you run your finger through some water, you'll see there's a whole street of vortices that get uh, produced behind your finger. If you run it reasonably slowly through water, you can see that. Um, those vortices are kind of little, little swirls in the water and they have the property that they will tend to be quite persistent, but you can't sort of get rid of that swirl without kind of slowing the whole thing down, that the swirl there's no continuous way to get rid of the thing that, that, that is this kind of uh, uh, so-called topologically stable. It's got this kind of hole in the middle, so to speak, because it's kind of going round, um, going round that center point. So that's a, that's a sort of a stable thing in this fluid in the case of water. So what we imagine is that there are similar kinds of things in the structure of, of space, that there are similar kinds of uh, sort of knotted uh, vortex-like things. That's a bad description of them. We are beginning to have better kind of very fancy mathematical descriptions of what's going on there. But that there are essentially things which are persistent in the structure, even though the individual atoms of space are different atoms of space over time, the, the structure remains the same. It's like the water wave I mentioned earlier. It's like these vortices, even though the particular molecules of water involved in that vortex may change, the, the structure of the vortex remains the same. And so it is with, uh, uh, with structures in space. And that's kind of why there's a persistence to, um, that we think that's sort of why there's persistence to anything in the universe, why it's consistent from one moment, why it appears consistent from one moment to the next is because there are these uh, sort of persistent objects that are produced by kind of the collective effect of many sort of atoms of space. It's kind of a non-trivial thing because it's a very weird thing to think that we are continually being rewritten. There's, you know, what is, what are we, what are we made of? Well, it's just like, you know, the individual, uh, I don't know, you know, as biological organisms, the individual pieces of our bones or whatever else are gradually being sort of broken down and the new pieces of bone are being formed there and so on. There's, there's a lot of us that is turning over regularly as one, one you know, set of cells die and another one is, is produced, but, but we still remain sort of the same organism, so to speak, uh, throughout our lives, even though the individual components that we have are being changed. It's like there's an old sort of philosophical uh, discussion people have. It's usually talked about in terms of the, the ship of Theseus. Theseus had the ship. It's made of wood. It's got a bunch of planks in it. Um, it is the ship of Theseus. But gradually over time, planks wear out. People replace one plank, then another. And eventually every plank in the ship has been replaced. But yet it is still the same ship in some sense, even though its components have been replaced. But so we think what happens in space is something much more extreme than that. It's that every, at every moment in time, essentially every atom of space that we're made of is, is changing. Yet there is a persistence to our identity through time. And actually another thing that I realized only very recently, in fact, is that when we move in space, it's the same kind of thing. It's not obvious that there should be an idea of what one would call, call pure motion, that one should be able to take a thing and move it in space. It could be the case. And, and as we move it, it's again, it's, it's ma being made up of different atoms of space as we move it. Um, but the, the thing, the fact that there is a persistent existence 
to that object as we move it, even though the underlying atoms of space from which it's made are changing, that's a sort of non-trivial fact about the world that it's possible to have what one might call pure motion, where one's just moving things around without them changing their character as you move them. I noticed there was another question here about, is there something smaller than quarks from C++? Um, that's very related to what I'm talking about here. The, uh, uh, in, if we look at, you know, physical atoms are made of atomic nuclei and electrons, the atomic nuclei are made of protons and neutrons, the protons and neutrons are made of quarks and gluons, um, what's below quarks? You can also ask what's below electrons. The answer is so far, nobody knows. So far as people can tell right now, electrons are like point particles. They're exact, precise geometrical points. Same, same with quarks. It's a little bit complicated in quantum field theory because these particles are always interacting with other particles. And so there's kind of a cloud of other particles around the thing. But the core electron, I'm just an electron and nothing but an electron, which by the way, you can't ever get in quantum field theory because there's always this kind of uh, uncertainty principle cloud of other things around it. But, but in some at least conceptual sense, there's a the pure bare electron and it's a point particle as far as current physics is concerned. Uh, it has no extent. We know it's smaller than, um, uh, let's see, it's smaller than a millionth the size of a proton. Uh, that's, that's the limit from experiments on the size of an electron. Uh, the size of a quark, I guess, is pretty much the same limits, about the millionth the size of a, of a proton. So a, quark, a proton might be made of three primary quarks and a bunch of extra, extra quarks and gluons around it. But um, those individual quarks that's made of it might be a millionth the size of, um, uh, of, the, of the proton, a, a less than a millionth the size of the proton. Uh, it's a bit similar to in an atom, that the complete size of an atom is about uh, um, uh, one tenth of a billion of a billionth of a meter. Um, and that's, um, that's about uh, uh, 100,000 times bigger than the atomic nucleus. So that, that the size of the whole atom is about 100,000 times bigger than the size of the nuclear, atomic nucleus in the center. Uh, the quarks that are within the protons and things within the atomic nucleus, we know are at least less than a millionth the size of, of, the, of the protons and so on. Now, you know, what's inside all those things? Well, in our theory of physics, we actually have something to say about that. What's inside is a whole complicated tangle of atoms of space, which as I've mentioned, there is some kind of uh, topological stability. There is some kind of structure like vortices in water and things like that, which is persistent. And that's what leads to things like quarks and so on. And um, it's not obvious that uh, exactly which kinds of you know, vortices or whatever they are, which kinds of particles exist, we don't know yet. They have a few ideas for how that might come out of our, of our models. Um, but there's a, a particular set. There are six kinds of quarks that exist. There are six kinds of leptons, which is what the electron is an example of, that exist. There are three kinds of things that are like electrons, electrons which have a mass of about um, uh, um, one thousandth, uh, one two thousandth of the mass of a proton. Then there's uh, a thing called the uh, muon, which has a mass of about a tenth the mass of a, of a proton. And there are things called tau leptons, which have a mass of about 1.5 times the mass of a proton. And nobody knows why these three different things, the electron, the muon, the tau lepton, they all seem like they're the same kind of thing. They just differ in being having different masses. And it's the same with the quarks. There are these uh, uh, two, there are six quarks broken into two categories, the, uh, the, the up quark, the charm quark, the top quark, and the down quark, the strange quark, the bottom quark. Um, and nobody knows why there are these collection of these three families of quarks, three families of leptons. Perhaps we will have an explanation of that in our physics project. We don't know yet. Um, but uh, if you ask the question in our kind of model of, of, of uh, physics, what, are, what is an electron made of? Well, it's ultimately made of these atoms of space. It's some kind of structure made up from these atoms of space. One thing that's kind of a, a weird point is that if you just say, in our models, one of the features of them is there's nothing in the universe except space. Electrons are just some complicated tangle in the structure of space. Everything else, you know, black holes, 
are also just some big tangle in the structure of space, not quite the same kind of tangle. They just have a, a certain structure with respect to the, the, uh, the form of these connections between the atoms of space. So one of the things that I, I'm thinking is probably going to be true is that in some sense, black holes are the same kind of thing as particles like electrons. And so in some very rough kind of sense, it won't be precisely like this, but you know, electrons are a little bit like very, very tiny black holes. They're a little bit like a, fun a funkiness in the structure of space, just as black holes are that, electrons are kind of a very small version of that. So when you start asking questions about what's uh, you know, what's inside quarks? Well, what's inside quarks is this tangle in the structure of space. And um, uh, whether, whether you can say, well, well, I can make out of that something which is a particle, a persistent kind of particle-like thing, probably not, but it's not clear. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a question, for example, are there more generations of quarks? We pretty much know that there aren't. We pretty much know that three is it, actually, in when I was much younger, this is, uh, when was it, 1979 or so, um, uh, with a friend of mine who subsequently won a Nobel Prize in physics, actually, um, a chap called David Pollitzer. Um, we, uh, we wrote this paper uh, where we kind of tried to work out in the kind of standard model of particle physics, what would happen if there were much more massive quarks and leptons? What would, what would happen to the structure of models of physics if that was the case? And what we could see was with the standard kind of setup of models of physics, these are models of physics that are not nearly as kind of foundational as the models that I'm dealing with now, um, but with the sort of standard models of physics that have, have been developed over the past, I don't know, what was it then, about 70 years or something, now it's more like 100 and something years. Um, the, uh, those, um, those models, their consistency requires that there not be quarks and leptons that are much heavier than, for example, the top quark that's been observed. Uh, what happens is, it's a, it's take a little bit of explanation to, to go through this and perhaps they're not worth it, but, but what basically happens is the thing that leads to the, 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 these particles having a mass, that mechanism, the so-called Higgs mechanism, kind of self-destructs if the amount of mass it has to put into individual particles is too large. It self-destructs because the kind of the quantum corrections to the, the, the way that it gives mass end up being bigger than the, the other features of it, and essentially the whole universe becomes unstable. So at least in the, in the sort of traditional models of physics, it's not likely there are any more generations of quarks and leptons because it would lead to instability in those, in those standard models of physics. Um, exactly how that will work in our model of physics, the sort of lower level model of physics, we don't yet know. And that's a sort of an interesting uh, question that is um, uh, going forward. So um, let's see, there were a whole bunch of questions here. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm gonna pick a few at random here. So there's a question from Gist here. How do black holes appear, sort of continuously going from zero topological holes to one? Okay, a black hole, ah, that's a complicated question. Hmm, okay. Um, okay, in, ordinary, in the ordinary theory of general relativity, in the ordinary theory of gravity, space-time is a continuum. That means that it, it's sort of a continuous fabric in a sense. You could make it if it was, it's actually three plus one dimensional roughly, but if it was, if it was two dimensional, you could make it out of this sort of uh, uh, actual piece of fabric, a rubber sheet or something like this. And the, the mathematical theory is such that you can distort the rubber sheet however you want, but you can never tear it. You can never break a piece off. You can never make a hole in it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's always a continuous rubber sheet it is just undergoing certain deformations. Okay, so that's the standard theory of general relativity as, as Albert Einstein you know, defined it in 1915. Um, it just distorts the rubber sheet. Okay, in our theory of physics, things get a bit more subtle because it isn't just this continuous rubber sheet. The rubber sheet is in a sense made of this network of atoms of space. And it's no longer the case in, in the standard theory of relativity. There's no way to, to tear the rubber sheet. In our model with networks and so on, 
it isn't true anymore that there's no way to kind of make tears and make discontinuities in the structure of space. You can go from something, in a sense, it's always got this discontinuous discrete structure. So the fact that something opens up or a piece breaks off and so on, it's not a dramatic, oh, you have to take a knife to the fabric of space. It's just something that can happen because a bunch of the edges that um, the, the connections that join one piece of space to another, all those connections sort of get reformed and they aren't there anymore. And so a piece breaks off. So in our models, it is possible to have, for example, pieces of space break off it's possible to have a change of topology in space. It's possible to have those things happen as a dynamical process. That's not possible in general relativity. However, there's a bit of a kludge in general relativity. So in a black hole, there is what happens is you solve the equations of general relativity, and they tell you things about the structure of space-time. And they tell you in the simplest case of non-rotating black holes, they tell you something that is a bit embarrassing. They say, at the center of a black hole, there is an infinite curvature. This fabric of space is infinitely curved. In fact, that infinite curvature is such that there's this place where the equations that you thought you used to describe the fabric of space can't apply. There's a singularity in space-time. And so you have to say, well, I thought I had this equ these equations that describe the whole of space, but actually, whoops, somehow at the center of this black hole, there is this place where there's a singularity and my equations don't apply. So now you have to kind of tiptoe around that, thinking about, well, how do you form a black hole? How do you form that singularity? It is a mathematical inevitability that there will be such a singularity. But if you say, show me equations, the actual moment of formation of that singularity, that's not something you can do. Now, the equations sort of escape that to some extent because one of the weird things that happens in black holes is that time stops. And that means that if you are going towards the singularity at the center of a black hole, you, in a sense, you, are, you, will, uh, you can think of it as it never gets there for you. You never, you never get to it because you kind of, you are, you're thinking time is passing, time is passing, time is passing. But actually, from an observer outside, time has stopped. And so you never get to the point where you actually reach that singularity because for you, time has stopped. Um, and so it, it's kind of like the analogy of the, you know, the, the, the computer that's, that's in there, the AI that's in there, and the AI effectively, somebody sort of pulls the plug of the AI and it just stops thinking. It, it's effectively, you know, it's a, it's a dying AI. It doesn't, it, its thought processes grind to a halt. And so it doesn't know that it never actually got, you know, it never, it never knows what happens when it got to the singularity because it's not thinking at that point. It's, it's, it's thought processes have stopped. Time has stopped for it. So, so that's some, um, so in, in the standard theory of general relativity, the, um, uh, there is this embarrassing point that you never really see the singularity. You never, you can never really describe how that singularity forms. does isn't the case in our models. And in fact, we can explicitly see that we've done actual simulations of the, formation of singularities and so on, and very wonderful things happen. A very bizarre thing that happens with spinning black holes is that in the standard theory of, of relativity, um, you there's sort of weird, weird things that happen if black holes spin faster than some critical, critical speed. And um, in our models, we can see weird things happening. And the weird thing that happens is a piece of the universe breaks off. If there is a supercritical black hole, that piece of the universe literally detaches. It's a, like a separate detached piece of space-time that can never reattach. So you better sort of hope that there are no supercritical black holes because they'll just be there'll be a, a a kind of a a um, uh, uh, you know pieces of the universe will be detaching off there. Now there are black holes that have observed been observed that are very close to that critical rotation speed, and in fact we suspect that very close to that critical rotation speed we will actually see essentially a microscope that sees into the sort of gravitational microscope that allows us to see the, the microscopic structure of space-time. And it's possible that we will even be able to see effectively this discrete structure in space-time and these supercritical black holes or black holes close to the critical uh, rotation speed that essentially pieces of the universe will be still connected, but hanging by a small number of threads. And the fact that it's a small number of threads means it becomes possible to see that it's a discrete number rather than a giant, you know, trillions and trillions and trillions of these things. So that's a possibility there. But that's um, the, the uh, 
the question of how you go from uh, kind of um, uh, topologically, you know, how you change the topology of space. That something that happens in our models does not happen in standard general relativity. Now, you know, an analogy to these things uh, that's interesting to see in terms of particles and so on is imagine you have a, a network, all kinds of, you know, you've got pieces of string that are connecting these nodes together and so on. Imagine this network is planar in the sense that you've got all these pieces of string and they're, co they're connected to these attachment points. And there's a way of, of putting down the attachment points so that there are no two pieces of string that have to cross over. So there's a, a bunch of results in mathematics. There's a thing with a fancy name of Kuratowski's theorem that tells you if you're going to have this network of pieces of string, then there's only, if they're, if, they are not going to be able to be laid out in a plane, just planarly so that nothing crosses over. There are particular subgraphs, particular local arrangements of sort of the connections of pieces of string, which force non-planarity. There are just two sort of, sort of in a sense, atoms of non-planarity that can exist. There are two configurations, which if present will lead to non-planarity and every non-planarity can be decomposed into these, into these pieces. So in a sense, if you then have something which is rearranging all these pieces of string, but always keeping them planar, then, then you can never generate one of these pieces of non-planarity. If you have one of these pieces of non-planarity, those kind of rearrangements that keep things planar will never destroy that piece of non-planarity. So the thing that happens when you're in, in sort of, that's an that's a analogy for particles in our structure of space, uh, of the network that represents space, then there's sort of a, a um, uh, 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 you know, that, that's, that's the analogy is that these pieces of non-planarity in this otherwise planar network, and when a particle, when uh, let's say two particles are created, you might be creating two pieces of non-planarity, and that's, that's something that you can do, and, and they sort of untangle from each other, and you get these two pieces of non-planarity, which in their local regions of, 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 the, of the network, um, you can't sort of locally untangle. So that's kind of a little bit of a picture of how one thinks about particles and so on. Well, let's see. Um, oh gosh, so many questions here. Uh, all sorts of interesting questions. Is there a computational, Spurdo asks, is there a computational system similar to quarks? Well, if you're asking the question, can we make a computational system that emulates what happens with quarks and what happens with gluons, which are the particles that, uh, are like the like the photons for electromagnetism, the, the the gluons are like the analogy of that for quarks and for what's called color charge, and they're what they're, they're what are responsible for sort of holding the quarks and a proton together. Uh, is there a way that we can make a sort of computational model of what's going on there? Um, I think the answer is yes. We haven't done it yet. But I think our models of the structure of, of, of fundamental physics will allow us to make essentially a computational model of what happens inside quarks and between quarks and so on. There's been an approach that's been uh, worked on for the last uh, 40 or so years called lattice gauge theory. And it's a way of sort of putting on a computer an emulation of what happens with quarks and gluons and so on. Unfortunately, it has a number of weird mathematical features. It, probably its weirdest feature is that it fundamentally has no notion of time. In fact, much more bizarrely, uh, what's done is that time, usually time is something somewhat different from space. In our models of physics, time is very different from space. But time is anyway, there's a, there's a sort of a different structure to, the, to time than the structure to space. And in, in lattice gauge theory, it's necessary to kind of turn time into something just like space. In the fancy language of physics, it's a thing called the Wick rotation. Um, and it basically turns, um, time becomes essentially a, 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 an additional, you can think of it as an imaginary uh, coordinates version of space. And so it's kind of a, a weird mathematical twisting that has to be done to make this lattice gauge theory thing. And then a bunch of results are got, which sometimes agree with experiment, 
Um, but it's it's a little hard to know how that corresponds because there's no notion of time. So it's not possible to, for example, have some, a phenomenon like scattering, where two particles come in, they collide, they go out again. You have to look at much more indirect versions of, of, the, of what's going on. But, but I think it looks like with our models, we will be able to get to something which is a, a proper kind of computerized version of something like what happens in, in theory of quarks and so on. The only problem is that when we do that simulation, we're doing it on the biggest computers we might imagine, um, but those computers still, the, uh, the number of sort of atoms of space that we can have in one of those computers, it might be a trillion or something in a, in a current computer, but that's unbelievably tiny compared to the number of atoms of space that actually might exist inside a single proton. So in other words, the universe is a much bigger user of computational resources than we ever could be with our electronic computers and so on. So the question is, do we get a good approximation to what's happening inside a proton by just using a trillion atoms of space as opposed to a trillion, 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 trillion atoms of space or something? And the chances are it will be quite a good approximation. That's what we're finding in the case of gravitation theory. Um, so that's an encouraging possibility for us being able to reproduce the important effects there uh, computationally. Um, Let's see. Zachary says, in our physics project, say in black hole, could it leave a sort of a wake in the atoms of space in its past light cone? Ah, uh, it's an interesting question. Hmm. Um, okay, so I think the answer is the following. The, um, the problem is, it's like, you run your finger through a piece of water, through some water. The molecules in the water are getting the precise, you know, motions of the molecules in the water are getting thrown all over the place by you running your finger through. But you will not detect those. Those are on much too small a scale for you to be aware of that. What you can tell is the large scale motion of the water behind your finger. And I think it's the same kind of thing in space. A black hole goes through space and it indeed will churn up. The, uh, the microscopic structure of space completely, just as sort of anything going through space will churn up the microscopic structure of space. But what will happen is a bit similar to what happens in a fluid, that the large scale behavior will be indistinguishable from the large scale behavior you would get if the thing hadn't been churned up that way. So I, I think it will, I'm, I think, Okay, so there is an interesting effect, which I'll describe to you guys, uh, which I wonder, I wonder, could that possibly happen? Well, okay, let me describe the effect. The, the buzzword is long time tails. And uh, let me describe the effect. It was observed in the 1960s to 1970s. Um, so imagine you have a bunch of billiard balls and let's say you're simulating them on a computer and the billiard balls are bouncing around and they have, they just elastically bounce off each other. Every time they collide, they bounce off. And you might say, well, is that a good model? You know, that might be a good model for molecules in a gas, for example. Okay, so one thing you can do is you can ask the question, if I, if I, uh, if I like, you know, knock one of those billiard balls, if I, if I sort of perturb one of those billiard balls, if I, if I poke one of those billiard balls, and then I let the billiard ball kind of, uh, then it runs into lots of other billiard balls, which run into lots more billiard balls and so on. The question is, how long will the effect of that poking of one billiard ball actually last? Because it's the billiard ball is kind of knocking into other ones, which are knocking into other ones. And you might think that the effect of just poking that one billiard ball would quickly decay away. You quickly wouldn't be able to tell that you'd done that because all these other billiard balls were randomly bouncing off each other and so on. And the effect would, would disappear. And people expected that that effect would die off exponentially in the sense that if you've, uh, you know, if you set amount of time, it's, uh, it's decreased by some factor, you go twice the time, it will decrease by that factor again. So the square of that factor and so on, it will keep going and it will, it will uh, decrease exponentially in time. So, so die off very rapidly. What was observed in computer experiments, people didn't know for a long time whether they'd done the experiments correctly, but it is correct, is that there is what's called a long time tail. There is a, 
uh, it lasts a lot longer than you would think. In, in, in mathematical terms, instead of being exponential decay, there's a power law decay um, to the, the effect of, um, I mean, the fancy mathematical terminology. Uh, I don't usually mention that in these in these sessions, but I, I, uh, it's the, the so-called autocorrelation functions um, are uh, uh, die off only and as a power law rather than exponentially. But in any case, so there is a, an effect that even these, at the very microscopic level, there is a slight persistence more than you would expect to this, um, uh, to, you know, making a perturbation in the system. And so the thing that I do wonder about, it's a good question, whether there are long time tails. Now, it doesn't mean that they would be observable because it's long time tails down at very, 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 very tiny times and very tiny distances and things. But it gives one a little bit more of a hope that there might be something observable. It's a good thing to look at. And I, I will, uh, I'll, I'll think about that some more. Thank you for that, uh, for that question. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a question from Riff. Uh, is the structure, I'm not quite sure what that's referring to, probably of electrons. If we knew what electrons were made of, would we be able to, would we be able to duplicate objects? Uh, no. No. And um, the, the, the issue of, of Let's say that we know that everything is made of this sort of structure, of the sort of tangled structure of the, of the structure of this network that represents space. And let's say we want to make a copy of one of those things that is in the structure of space. We're not really given much advantage in doing that. It's like saying, I've got a vortex in water and I want to make another vortex. How do I do that? And how do I do it using just the water that's there? There's no real good way to do that. In other words, just knowing what the thing is made of doesn't allow you to make a, a physicalized copy of it. Now, we could imagine if we were making a copy in a computer, we were making a simulation of it. Yes, absolutely, that gives us a big leg up on doing that. But in terms of making a physical copy, being able to clone things physically, no. In fact, in, in quantum mechanics, in sort of the theory of very microscopic things, which is the theory that we now finally, I'm happy to say, I think actually have a pretty good understanding of how it really works. There are these things they call the no cloning theorems that basically talk about the impossibility of replicating quantum states. And we can kind of see pretty explicitly in our models why those, why those are that way and why it's not possible to kind of, uh, uh, it's a little different than the question of, of replicating physical objects. But I think we can see why it is sort of fundamentally hard. There's no, we can't expect to have a procedure for replicating physical objects. Now I have, I have to say we can't expect to because one of the things that's true is once you have this kind of underlying computational structure that space and everything else is made of, exactly what you can build from that, it's an endless frontier. It's just like if you're given the raw material of a computer, there's you know the programs you can build on top of that raw material. There's an infinite hierarchy, an infinite tower of ever more sophisticated programs that you can build just using the hardware of your computer. And so it will be with the structure of space and so we don't really know what the what the infinite possible technologies that we could build from kind of the, the raw material of physical space are. Um, oh my gosh, so many things here. Uh, let's see. Um, Oh, there's a question here, which maybe I shouldn't try and try and address from uh, Bagva. Is it really possible to get something from literally nothing? Oh, boy. Uh, I think I actually figured that out recently. I didn't think I'd ever figure that out. It wasn't clear it was even a question that any kind of science answer to it. Let me give you at least a rough indication of that. And that has to do with, it's related to the question of why does the universe exist? Uh, how can you, why is there something rather than nothing? So we talk about making models of the universe. We talk about saying in a computer, we can reproduce what the universe does. But that's a little different from saying that that model is actualized as physical things in the actual universe, or at least it seems to be a little different. So we might say, and, and somebody was asking about simulation hypothesis, that's kind of the hypothesis that maybe we are just a video game being played by the gods, so to speak. Um, that, uh, you know, that in a sense, we are just 
the, all of our existence is just like a program that's running, that's being run by the gods on their on their uh, um, uh, you know on their big video game simulator, so to speak. And so I think that the um, uh, so there's this question of of why is it that even if we have a model for the universe which we could simulate on a computer. Um, what makes the universe actually be actualized? What makes that model jump from being purely a model to being the actuality of the universe? Okay, so I didn't think there would ever be a scientific answer to that question, but I think there is one. And it's a, I wonder if I can explain it here. So here's roughly the way to think about it. So we might think there is a definite rule for the universe. We run the rule for the universe, it reproduces everything we see in the universe. But let's imagine instead that we were running all possible rules for the universe all together. We might think, oh, if we're running all possible rules for the universe, how can we ever say anything about anything? Because anything possible can happen because we've got all these possible rules. And so it's not the case that, that so there's gonna be a rule that does anything. Okay, so this is the thing to realize that is a tricky thing. So you have all possible rules and you start them off in all possible ways. And two rules, you might start off from, from some state of the universe. And then there are two possible rules you might apply to that state of the universe and they lead to two different states of the universe. But then something else tricky can happen. There might be two other rules that you can apply which will take those two different states of the universe and turn them into a st the same state. So in other words, just as you can branch in this kind of giant network of all possible states of the universe, so you can also merge. So something, when you apply all these different rules, you are, you are taking a state of the universe and splitting it into two different possible states of the universe, but so also you could take two different possible states of the universe and by applying two different rules, you can merge them into the same state. Okay, so they might say, well, that's kind of a trivial effect. It's not that important. Actually, that effect is unbelievably critical because that effect entangles together what happens when you follow different rules for the universe. It, it leads to this giant sort of entanglement of different possibilities of what happens when different things, when you apply different rules to different possible states of the universe. And so the object that you get by following all possible rules from all possible states is this deeply tangled object that is full of sort of places where things that you thought were gonna end up with something different end up with something the same and then they branch out into something different and so on. It's a big complicated entangled object. And that entangled object is sort of a thing that represents the, the all possible theories of physics in a sense. Now let's imagine that what's actually happening in the universe is it is running all possible theories of physics. That's what the universe is, is something which is running all possible theories of physics. Now the question is, how do we perceive that thing? So remember that we are embedded inside that whole complicated thing. We're part of this whole thing that's branching into different, uh, you know, our brains as we go think about things, they're branching into all the, you know, the, the actual stuff in our brains is getting branched into all these different possible histories and so on. We are, we are part of this giant, what we call rural multiway system of, of all this sort of following all these different possible rules and so on. So then the question is, let's say we're part of that. How do we actually perceive what is going on in the universe, given that? Well, this is, this is skipping a few steps ahead, but basically, as soon as we assume that we have co coherent identity through time, as soon as we believe that, as soon as we, um, we, we construct a way of describing the universe in which we have a coherent thread of experience through time, which is sort of a fundamental feature of of consciousness and the way that we perceive the universe. As soon as we assume that, we force certain ways to look at this sort of complicated uh, universe of all possible universes. That, that assumption, in a sense, forces us to look at only certain slices of this sort of universe of all possible universes. And it turns out that the slices that we look at necessarily follow the core laws of physics that we know. So that's a, that's a very non-trivial fact that has come out of our physics project, 
that if you start off with sort of the universe of all possible universes and you sample it as an observer inside that universe, following the same laws as that universe, then inevitably, as soon as you assume certain things, as soon as you imagine certain things about the way that you are perceiving what happens in the universe, it necessarily follows that you will observe the laws of physics, the, the main laws of physics that we know. So in a sense, the question of what, what you have to explain then, so, so what, what we're saying is, if we take something which is following all possible rules, then it is inevitably the case that as observers embedded within that, we will perceive things which correspond to what we know to be standard physics. So now the question is, why does this universe of all possible universes, what does it mean for that to exist or not exist or whatever? So what you realize is that thing is just the working out of all possible formal facts. So for example, one plus one equals two. Once you have the definition of one, the definition of plus, the definition of two, it is a necessary thing that one plus one equals two. There's no, you can imagine implementing that by using stones and counters and so on. But one plus one equals two is something formally true. It does not depend on any instantiation as anything. So, so it is the case that this kind of um, uh, sort of theory of physics that where you say physics follows all possible rules. In a sense, what it's doing is every possible formal system is being, there is an instance of every possible formal system. What this big complicated universe of all universes is, is the working out of all possible formal systems, which is something that does not need to be actualized. It is a merely formal thing because all these systems like one plus one equals two and so on, they are just abstract things. And the whole point is that to an observer who is part of this whole sort of abstract object that's being worked out, that observer will perceive exactly what we know we perceive in terms of the laws of physics, even though the thing that is there is just this formal thing that consists of all these possible formal pieces being worked out. So in a sense, what one's saying is it the, the existence of the universe is no more than the, ex than the fact that formal things are possible, the fact that you can imagine writing down one plus one equals two. It's the aggregate of all those formal things. And it just turns out that as if you sort of put yourself in the middle of all of that, you, as in a sense, will perceive things which include the laws of physics. So in other words, in terms of the simulation hypothesis, where you say, is it, are we inside a video game being played by the gods? Well, in a sense, we're inside a, a video game of all video games. So in other words, in a sense, all possible video games are being played and we are, we, our observation of that is something which it turns out as a, as a mathematical derivable fact corresponds inevitably to something where we perceive laws of physics as the laws of physics uh, turn out to be. So that was that was a bit deeply philosophical. I'm sorry. That was, but if you ask a question like why does the universe exist, you, you can't expect anything different than something quite deeply philosophical. But anyway, the, the I think the answer, I think we actually have a, a, a pretty good shot at the actual answer, which is the universe exists because, in a sense, all possible formal things that we can all possible formal things in some sense exist. And therefore, it is a necessary feature of the perception of a thing embedded within this sort of set of all possible formal things that you'll get something which is like ordinary physics. Now, one consequence of this, which again, I, maybe I shouldn't go into uh, in more detail, but, but there's a question, does mathematics exist? In other words, you, you write down, you know, you might think mathematics, oh, it's just a set of rules. We can say, we're going to choose to make it be the case that if X and Y are numbers, X plus Y equals Y plus X, and we have a whole bunch of other rules, these are the so-called axioms of mathematics. And you can write down one set of axioms, you can write down another set of axioms. You might say all mathematics is, is the working out of these particular sets of axioms that we chose. And in that sense, mathematics doesn't really exist. It's just something where somebody chose to write down these axioms, and so then you work out its consequences. One of the things that I've realized, and I have to say it's only in the last few weeks, is that um, the uh, that in a sense, if you imagine 
a generalized mathematics, a mathematics of all possible mathematics that consists of, in a sense, thinking about writing down all possible axiom systems and looking at their consequences in much the way, same way that I described looking at the consequences of all possible rules for physics. If you look at that thing made of the, the consequences of all possible axiom systems, that thing is, again, some elaborate formal object. Turns out it's the same elaborate formal object that is that thing for physics. It is the same working out of all possible formal systems that you have in physics. So in a sense, if you say physics exists, the universe exists, it's a slice of this, of this working out of all possible rules, you have to say mathematics exists in the same sense, because it too is a working out of all possible uh, kind of mathematical rule, all possible uh, formal rules. So then the question is, just as we have this notion of consciousness, our way of sampling the physical universe, what is the kind of mathematical analog of that? What is it that a mathematician does that samples this kind of mathematical universe of all possible mathematics is? And what, is the, what are the simplifying features of a mathematical consciousness which potentially drive general laws of mathematics? And that's the, that's the cliffhanger. That's where I am right now in thinking about this stuff. I haven't figured that out. I'm kind of guessing that in what one might call metamathematical space, the space of all possible mathematical theorems, the space of all possible results in mathematics, that there is an analog of things like general relativity and an analog of things like gravity in that space of all possible mathematical theorems, where instead of there being atoms of space that we can interpret as being physical positions in space, instead the atoms of space are like mathematical statements, like two plus two equals four, for example. And, um, the, uh, and that, that somehow the, that our sampling as mathematicians or something <clears throat> samples that space in, in some way that sort of reproduces the kinds of things that we experience in human mathematics. Okay, so a few other, let me just, I'll, I'll cover a few other things. There's so many interesting questions here. There's a question here from Prutz. It's often said that nothing can escape black holes, not even light. Can gravitational waves escape black holes? The answer is kind of yes. Um, the, it's a somewhat complicated thing because the description, for example, when two black holes merge, they emit huge amounts of gravitational radiation. And gravitational waves... Uh, yeah, this is a little bit of a complicated thing. Um, the basic answer is yes, gravitational waves are sort of excluded. Uh, black holes, okay, outside a black hole, okay, any matter like electrons, atoms, tables, chairs, whatever, the gravitational effect of a black hole, it'll pull those things into the black hole. It'll pull them through the event horizon. And the event horizon is the place where, where nothing, even light, uh, the, the escape velocity is larger than, this, than the speed of light and nothing sort of escapes the event horizon. So all these things get pulled inside the event horizon. But one thing, so you might say, so a black hole can never sort of have an effect on things because everything is pulled into the event horizon of the black hole. But there's an exception. The black hole does have a gravitational effect because the black hole has this mass and it, it produces gravity. And so the gravitational field of a black hole extends all the way out. You know, it has an inverse square law or whatever else, but the gravitational effect of a black hole, there is a distant gravitational effect of a black hole. Now, gravitational waves are a gravitational effect. And so they're kind of excluded from the, everything gets pulled into the black hole. They're, they're, they don't work the same way because the, the black hole does have a gravitational effect. The gra black hole does have a, um, uh, an effect on, on, um, on the outside world through, through gravity. In any case, the, the, when, when you think about this question about sort of things getting pulled into a black hole, there's a lot of confusion there because the, a black hole, in some sense, you start a black hole off, you follow the laws of physics, and you might say, how does it end up being the case that you have a particular set of initial conditions for the black hole, then the black hole forms, everything's pulled into the black hole, it's like everything's crunched up together, and all that information associated with what went into the black hole is all lost somewhere. And by the way, we know pretty good evidence that black holes evaporate 
And eventually, they, as a result of quantum effects, they evaporate again and the black hole disappears eventually. So then the question is, the information that went into the black hole and sort of got crunched up inside the black hole, some, somehow it came out again at the end. And that's a rather mysterious thing. In our theory of physics, it looks like we understand how that works. And it has a very bizarre feature. So let me let me explain one thing, just sort of for fun with black holes. So if you're pulled into a black hole, you, uh, let's see, you, you're the, you, as far as you're concerned, time is passing, you're, you know, you're measuring time, you, you go through the event horizon, you don't even notice going through the event horizon because, but the different, what's happening is that the time of somebody who is far away from the black hole is now very different from your time. So what happens is gravity slows down time. Whenever there's, there's a phenomenon called gravitational redshift, whenever there is a strong gravitational field, time runs slower. And the uh, and that's what's happening in a black hole. As, you, as you're pulled in through this event horizon, effectively, time is running more and more slowly for you. And in a sense, to an observer outside, you, I'm sorry, you, you, time is running as time runs for you. But to an observer on the outside, it looks as if time is slowing down for you. So that means as you watch that table falling into the black hole, it will freeze right at the event horizon as far as somebody far away from the black hole is concerned. They will never, that time for them, that the time of the, the, as far as the table is concerned, it's just keeping going and it's falling through the event horizon. But as far as a distant observer is concerned, it will have appeared to have frozen at the event horizon. So that phenomenon is um, as far as space time is concerned, there's time effectively stops there for an outside observer. Now, let's see, is this explainable? So one of the things that happens is that in this information paradox with black holes, the thing that happens is that, oh boy, there's a, sorry, there's one concept that, uh, see, this is, this is what's difficult in giving these explanations, is that each one of these things is built on different kinds of ideas in physics, for example, and, uh, the question is, can you get to a particular uh, result in the explanation without running into some horrible uh, sort of sinkhole of some complicated idea that, um, uh, that you have to kind of get through? The complicated idea here is the idea of virtual particles and the idea of spontaneous production of, of particle-antiparticle pairs in the vacuum. But let, let's just say that for reasons of, of, of the way quantum field theory works, can all the time in the vacuum, you are having little electron, positron. Positron is the antiparticle of the electron. There's for a very short time, you're producing a positron and electron, and then they annihilate again. It's as if that didn't happen, but actually it does happen, and that's happening throughout space. In fact, in our models of physics, that process of the sort of the so-called vacuum fluctuations are ultimately what knit together the structure of space. But that's a feature of our models. That's not something that you see in traditional quantum field theory. But in traditional quantum field theory, you do see this, this formation of very short-lived electron-positron pair, they annihilate again. Okay, well, so they happily just, they, they come into existence, they annihilate again. Very short amounts of time, it's all good, nobody notices it. However, if that process happened right at the event horizon of a black hole, and one member of the electron-positron pair fell into the black hole, and the other one didn't, what would happen is they wouldn't be able to annihilate anymore because one of them is, is sucked into the black hole and it's no longer available to annihilate the other particle. And so what that means is that's the origin of this thing called Hawking radiation, where which is a, a emission of particles from a black hole. It's, it's essentially because there are these vacuum fluctuations and one part of the vacuum fluctuation is pulled into the black hole, leaving the other one unable to, to sort of annihilate again and, and disappear. So it's been sort of confusing how that works. Um, the, uh, I'll, ju I'll just say just for fun, and it's a little bit more complicated to explain. The, um, the question of what really happened there is partly a question of, in quantum mechanics, there's sort of a question of, in quantum mechanics, there are many histories for the universe that develop. There aren't definite things that happen. There are many different histories, and we only know the probabilities for different things to happen. So. In the case of, of this uh, black hole event horizon thing, there are different histories that develop. 
And one history says the thing falls into the black hole, another history says it doesn't, it goes somewhere else. There are all these different histories. Now, normally, when we observe the universe, we succeed in knitting together all those different histories. That's the process of quantum measurement, is what knits together those different histories. And the, in a sense, it is the, a feature of our brains and so on that we are able to take these sort of branched quantum histories. And the reason, which I've understood only very recently, is that our brains are also branching. And so what we're doing is we're a branching brain is observing a branching universe. And it, it turns out that that allows you to have the possibility of the branching brain to perceive a definite thing as happening. Anyway, at the, at the edge of a black hole, there's a thing we call the entanglement horizon. And at that entanglement horizon, the very bizarre thing that happens is that no brain can knit together those different branches of history. In other words, if, if the brain was trying to come to a conclusion, what actually happened here? The brain would never be able to do that. It would always say, I don't know, there's this quantum branch and there's that quantum branch. I can't bring these things together. Uh, in a sense, you can say it can't form a classical thought, a definitive thought. It's always the, the branches, the different branches of history of the brain are not able to be merged together to conclude that something definite happened. And that's, that's more or less, that's the weird effect that we think happens uh, at, the, at the edge of a black hole. Um, well, anyway, the, the uh, oh my gosh, the, you guys are very, very active today. Um, I'll try and just address a few more of these. I, this is a, a holiday day today, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm able to spend a bit more time on this. Um, the, uh, uh, let's see, there's a question from Cast here. How could we be reliable judges of what is metaphysically possible rather than what seems possible to us given our current evidence, epistemic possibility? How could we get evidence about which formal systems are metaphysically possible to be realized? Boy, okay. This was, you guys are, are asking me to do serious real-time philosophy here. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, let, me, let me take a little bit of a crack at that. It might get a little complicated. So, let's see. Um, This question about what is in principle possible, what is formally possible versus what we know to actually be possible by doing experiments. Ah, this is, this is gonna get us into some, um, well, okay. The surprising fact about what is formally possible is, is the following thing. And it's related to the idea of universal computation. So you might think that given certain rules by which a thing operates, there would be, it would be able to do certain things based on those rules and, and nothing other than the things that it was set up to do according to its rules. You know, you have an adding machine, all it does is add. You have a multiplying machine, all it does is multiply. Okay, the surprising fact is that there exist universal computers, computers where given a fixed hardware, a fixed set of instructions for the computer, it's possible to make software, it's possible to set up the initial conditions for the computer to make the computer do anything, to make it run any program you can imagine running. So you might think you've got a computer, it has a particular set of instructions in its hardware, it can only do particular things. But no, when looked at in terms of the programs it can run, those programs can, it can do anything, with, in, in the, those programs can do anything. In other words, you could say, how does the computer run the video conferencing software I'm running right now? Well, in the end, it's running it in terms of machine instructions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A different computer can run the very same video conferencing, can achieve the same functionality for video conferencing. In other words, from a fixed set of primitives, you can achieve uh, different sets of primitives, different universal sets of primitives can achieve all the same kinds of things. So it's not the case that you're kind of locked in these islands of one set of 
one sort of set of possible rules does one kind of thing, another set of rules does another kind of thing. Once you have these rules that are computationally universal, any one of them can be used to construct a thing that does anything that can be done. And so I think that that's, that's an important thing to realize in terms of understanding what is kind of metaphysically possible versus um, uh, uh, versus what um, um, the uh, um, versus the uh, um, um, what am I saying? But versus, um, uh, in other words, given a universal system, anything is possible in some sense. It will be implemented differently in different universal systems, but in terms of the way that, for example, it will be perceived, it will be the same. So I think that's that's part of the sort of philosophical untangling of this question. All right, maybe a couple more things here, and then. Um, Oh gosh, there's a there's a point here. Hello asks implications of hypercomputation. So the thing I just described about universal computers, um, there is a set of computations that can be done by a what we currently think of as a universal computer. The formal version is things like Turing machines, but it can be just a practical computer that has its particular instructions. You can write programs that do a whole range of things. Okay, but imagine there's a thing that no existing computer can do in a finite amount of time. There are things where you could say, ask questions like, what will be the infinite time results of this thing? And you can prove that no computer can answer that question in a finite amount of time. It would take any of our existing computers an infinite amount of time to answer that question. Well, let's imagine, just as a, as a thought experiment, let's imagine we had a black box that just answers those questions. It's usually called an oracle in the theory of computation. Um, it's kind of a, a bad name in terms of the classical use of the term oracle, but never, never mind that. It's not like the Delphic oracle, but it's, a, it's another kind of oracle where you're, where you're saying, in a sense, this computation that for any computer that we know how to build would take an infinite time, but we've got a black box that just tells us, oh, the answer is this. So imagine we have such a black box. That's what hypercomputation is is the idea that we could have such black boxes that jump ahead and answer what would otherwise be infinite computational questions can be answered in finite time. And so then the question is, what does it mean if there is hypercomputation? So, so one thing is, in our theory of physics, one of the definitive things that our theory of physics says is hypercomputation is impossible in our universe. So it's, that's not a, it's not an obvious fact. It's not something derivable. It's essentially claimed to be a law of nature that hypercomputation is impossible in our universe. Actually, we can go a little further than that. It's actually a little bit more bizarre. In this theory where the universe runs according to all possible rules, you say, well, why don't you throw a hypercomputation rule in there as well? In addition to all these ordinary computational rules, throw in a hypercomputational rule and say, you know, what happens then? Okay, what happens is kind of bizarre. What happens is for any observer that's like us, anything embedded in this universe that's made of stuff that isn't hypercomputational, there will be everything hypercomputational will be separated by an event horizon from everything that isn't. So, in other words, assuming that we're not hypercomputational already, then everything about if there was hypercomputation in the universe, we would never be able to tell that it was there because it would be as if it was on the other side of a black hole event horizon from us. Um, and it would sort of separate out from the rest of the universe, the pieces that are hypercomputational would separate out. So in that sense, and, and in fact, one reason that happens is because time progresses for us and the rest of the universe, it just chugs along. And you know, as, as time goes on, all these computations are happening. That's kind of what the experience of time is is all these computations happening. But let's imagine we have this hypercomputational thing over here. It says, oh, you're wasting all your time, so to speak, doing all these computations to figure out what's gonna happen. I, the hypercomputational thing, I can just jump ahead. For me, time, your, inf your time has basically is nothing for me. It's as if your time has stopped for me. And that's essentially exactly the same kind of thing that happens in black holes. So in a sense, if there is hypercomputation, uh, our models of physics say in the part of the universe accessible to us, everything accessible to us is only computation and not hypercomputation. And even we think we can derive formally 
that if there is hypercomputation, it must be separated from us in the structure of our models of physics. So it's kind of a prediction of our models of physics. Um, So let's see, maybe maybe one or two other things here. Um, uh, well, GSEP is asking, what's what was the last crazy or unrealistic but interesting thought with regard to science or reality, a speculation that isn't based on any research but is an intuition? Um, yeah, well, I've been having a bunch of those very recently, actually. Uh, it's um, I think that what I realized is that the fundamental theory of physics is the same as the fundamental theory of mathematics. And that in a sense, and something people have been working on our physics project, particularly a person called Jonathan Gorard and I have been talking about this for, for about a year, but it's sort of become clearer to me that, um, uh, you know, how this really potentially works. And, um, uh, I think, well, let's see, um, kind of describing, well, okay, so, so one thing, uh, maybe this is too, too, too complicated, but, but um, uh, one thing that's always interesting to me is what, you know, science has gone in certain directions has built up certain theories and many things are built on top of those scientific theories. Once you have a scientific theory and it's well-developed, it makes sense to leverage that theory and just build more and more and more stuff on top of that theory. Uh, and so it's happened in many areas, like in the foundations of mathematics that's happened. I have a strong suspicion that, that the direction that's been taken for the last hundred years is probably wrong. And that, that, the, um, that the way people have tried to base mathematics on individual axiom systems just isn't the right way to think about it. And actually Plato, back a very long time ago, had kind of a, a more holistic view of mathematics that I'm kind of suspecting is correct. Um, and, uh, and that we can actually, that, that view of mathematics is going to allow us to derive some very general meta-mathematical facts um, that... Uh, uh, go, go that is sort of a, a different level of mathematical thinking than we've been able to have so far. Anyway, that's a, that's just a, um, uh, um, it's just a, a, a thought there. There's a whole bunch related to that. But uh, Dylan asks, if a piece of space breaks off, does it just float around in the universe? Well, you see, the problem is it isn't in the universe. It, space, it is breaking off from space. It is a separate piece of space that is not in any way connected to the space that we know about. So it is just separate. It's like saying, if you lived on the surface of the earth and you know, the moon broke off from the earth and you were creatures now living on the surface of the moon, uh, there isn't a sense in which you know, your, your, your world is the surface of the moon now, separate from the surface of the earth. And it's the same kind of thing here. It's a, it's a separate piece of space and it has no interaction whatsoever. It has absolutely no connection to existing space. So all of the little rules that are running in it, they're all running within that region of space. Now, if you really want to get complicated about it, in this idea of multiple histories that happens in quantum mechanics, it's an interesting question. As this piece breaks off, does it break off in all possible histories? Or how does it work? How does the bundle of histories that break off relate to the piece of space that's breaking off. And I suspect that there is a sense in which, hmm, let me see. That's an interesting question. Hmm. Okay, I have not thought about this properly. That there's, a, there's this notion of ordinary space, which is the sort of connection of all these atoms of space together. There's a notion of what we call branchial space, the space of possible branches of history. And that too, is a space of different possible things that can happen in history. And it's a, it's a, a branchial space and it's the one in which quantum mechanics plays out. And so a good question, oh yes, actually I did figure this out. Yeah, um, is the question of whether there are, what happens with respect to this branchial space when a piece of the universe breaks off? And I think what happens, there's sort of a, a formal idea in quantum mechanics, uh, things called super selection rules, that I think is what happens there. And I think what will happen is that essentially no observer 
could ever will ever conclude yes that the, the observer can never put together the thing which is in the broken off piece of the universe with the thing which is in the unbroken off piece they can never be sort of thought about together there are always things which are for any observer there are always there'll be observers in the broken off piece and there'll be observers in the non broken off piece and no observer could ever straddle the difference the, 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 those two pieces so it's as if they really really are separate and they they just don't don't relate to each other um uh if a piece of the universe detaches in a supercritical black hole is that universe is the universe contained in the piece that breaks off so subject to hawking radiation ay 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 um let me think about that for a second um I think the answer is okay here's the answer I think Hawking radiation is something that happens when you have a black you have space that's kind of all of space and somewhere in space is this black hole with a little event horizon and you're looking at what happens outside of the black hole when a piece breaks off I think the piece that breaks off is its own whole universe there's no outside to it so there's no sense in which you can have radiation that goes from from the from the thing to the outside of the thing there is no outside it's just that's it the thing that broke off is the whole universe is the whole sort of sort of separated universe and so there isn't a place in which radiation can occur um and uh, stenio is asking was the universe created from an explosion from a super 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 black hole well in some sense yes i mean in in, in some sense the universe even in the standard models of cosmology is is sort of like a white hole it's sort of like a thing from which uh you start off from from the singularity that you can't explain and then all this stuff is coming out from that singularity it's sort of that same that same kind of idea so yes in some mathematical sense that's right i'm not sure that that's a good way to think about it i my way of thinking about it tends to be the universe starts as this infinite dimensional thing that where everything is connected to everything and gradually that sort of as things unfold that becomes something that is more like our three dimensional space i think that's a better way to think about it rather than the traditional way of thinking about black holes and so on which is something that already lives in three dimensional space um okay there's andrew von is asking in this close critical black holes we see a handful of threads that connect our universe in an actual microscope you see a structure against a black background what's the background here well there isn't one um the best you would see is and when i say see it's very much in quotation marks the way you would detect this is the following in if you have something i don't know you have a uh a, a bunch of um sand grains that are going through some some you know that they're, they're going through a tube or something you've got enough sand grains it seems like it's just a continuous flow of sand but let's say you make the tube very 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 narrow eventually the tube is narrow enough that individual grains go through the tube and you can tell if you're measuring how much mass is going through the tube usually it'll just be oh there's a whole bunch of mass going through and it doesn't change very much from one moment in time to another because they're just you know there are there might be a million sand grains or a million and one that's not very different but by the time you're down to this very thin tube and it's like well one sand grain went through or no sand grains went through at that moment then it's a different kind of thing and you can tell that it's kind of like there's this there's this you can you can sort of hear the fact though not hear i mean again i'm using analogies here um you you can sort of tell oh just one sand grain went through or no sand grains went through in that moment it's the same kind of thing it, it, it it's usually called shot noise and it's kind of like if you imagine uh i don't know if you imagine raindrops falling on a on a roof or something and um you know there are lots and lots of raindrops you just have this continuous kind of hissing sound or something but as it gets down to individual raindrops you'll start hearing the individual raindrops and it's the same kind of thing here that you might be able to see effects that don't seem like they're they're smooth continuous effects that are unchanged with time but more you'll actually detect those random fluctuations it's a little bit the same way that brownian motion was detected when people discovered molecules back in the 1830s maybe 1850s perhaps one of the things that was done was you put a pollen grain in water 
pollen grain is light enough that when it's kicked by individual molecules of water hitting it, it moves. And so instead of the pollen grain just sort of smoothly moving around, it's light enough, it's small enough that it's sensitive to individual buffeting by individual molecules. And so you can kind of tell that there are individual discrete molecules there. And that's the kind of thing one might expect with these, uh, with these black holes where things are, are potentially breaking off. Um, all right, we should probably, uh, much as there are lots of interesting questions about lots of different things, um, uh, let's see, there's a question from GSEP. Could black holes be a pinch in space where it goes inside out? Actually, in the traditional theory of general relativity, in rotating black holes, so-called Kerr black holes, something very much like that happens. Uh, it's believed that that would never actually be observed and it's inside event horizons, which means that no outside observer could observe it. But mathematically, that's something very much like that. Things sort of turn themselves inside out from black holes to white holes and so on. It's, it's rather bizarre. Um, it, it isn't quite as bizarre in our models of space time. Um, in a sense, people would say, well, who cares because it's all inside an event horizon. But in our models, we can actually, we can actually tell what happens inside there. And um, uh, well, it isn't as bizarre. The most bizarre thing happen that seems to happen is that pieces can potentially break off. By the way, someone asked about, perhaps somebody asked about, about gravitational radiation and black holes. One of the effects that I think is a consequence of our models is a thing that I call black hole wind. So I think there is a, um, uh, there's a, there will be a, a small amount of gravitational radiation that we sort of emitted from black holes uh, as a necessary feature of the discrete structure of space. Whether it's large enough to be detectable, I don't know, but it's an interesting effect. Um, and, uh, um, oh, Prutz is asking, black holes rotate at critical speed, could it expose hypercomputation? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think the thing, I think the pieces just break off. I think that the question of whether Yes, in, in our models, the passage of time is a consequence of computational processes occurring. And so hypercomputation requires that you infinitely speed up the passage of time. And that's not something you can do within our models. So uh, anyway, there's a, there's, a, um, um, uh, there's a question here about, uh, and I really need to wrap up, but there's a, I'm just, um, um, uh, the question here from Zeebsby, are there plans to somehow incorporate formal method tooling? I think, think what formal methods means is sort of you've got a computer program, but you make essentially a mathematical proof about what the computer program does. And um, in fact, yes, in our, in our explorations of, of our theory of physics, we're making use of a whole bunch of those kinds of techniques. In fact, to make it even more bizarre, the, the actual evolution of these different paths in quantum mechanics can be thought of as being like possible proofs. In other words, to, to a, a proof is showing these two things are equal. We've got certain, certain relations that we can use in mathematics. Can we piece these together to get from one thing to another to show that these two things are equal? That turns out to be something like finding these paths in quantum mechanics. And we've actually done a bunch of work on, on using that in a practical way. All right, I should uh, wrap up here. And for those in the, in the US, um, uh, Happy holiday weekend. And uh, for other people, I look forward to uh, um, doing this again uh, same time next week. Thanks very much.